Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, you are the radiance of the Eternal Father. You enlighten the world with your divine teachings and filled it with knowledge through the simplicity of your apostles. Make us worthy to praise you as we celebrate the feast of your chosen apostles, Peter and Paul. By their witness, may we come to understand your hidden mysteries and keep your life-giving commandments that we may be made worthy to share in their happiness. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Father most holy, who sent his only begotten Son for our salvation. And to the glorious Son, who chose Peter and Paul, and filled them with wisdom and holiness, and sent them out to preach. And to the Holy Spirit, who strengthened and supported them in their apostolic mission. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O Christ our God, you were sent to us from the Father. You are the High Priest whom we profess as the merciful and forgiving one. You chose twelve apostles and by your Holy Spirit made them wise. You sent them to proclaim the gospel of life and salvation. You honored Peter and Paul, two of your chosen apostles and true witnesses. Peter and Paul are two temples, and in them dwells the Spirit of God, the Word, who became flesh. Peter and Paul are two jewels, adorning the crown of the Holy Church, the Bride of Christ. Peter and Paul are two strong pillars, upon which the Holy Church has been built. Now, O Lord, we ask you through their intercession and with the fragrance of this incense to look upon us with the eyes of mercy and not to forsake us who implore you. Strengthen the weak, heal the sick, satisfy the hungry, Bring back those who are far and protect those who are near. Forgive sinners except those who repent and pardon our brothers and sisters who have gone to their rest. May we who worship you be united with your chosen apostles, Peter and Paul, with your holy mother, the Virgin Mary, and with the choirs of the prophets, the apostles, and the martyrs. You are good and compassionate, and we raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever.
O Apostles Peter and Paul, as we celebrate your feast, we ask you to raise in your own hands the fragrance of this incense which we have offered, that it may be a sweet fragrance and a pleasing sacrifice. Through your intercession, may God forgive our sins and favorably remember all the children of the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. Preach good news, offer praise to the Lord God. May He help us through their prayers. The second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Baruch Morabum. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish to children forever. To my shame I say that we were too weak. But what anyone dares to boast of, I am speaking in foolishness. I also dare. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I am talking like an insane person. I am still more, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, far worse beatings, and numerous brushes with death. Five times at the hands of the Jews, I received 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I passed a night and a day on the deep, on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own race, Dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers and sisters, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, through hunger and thirst, through frequent fastings, through cold and exposure. And apart from these things, 
there is the daily pressure upon me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is led to sin, and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Praise be to God always. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. We the listeners the Holy Gospel, proudly proclaimed to you, listening in your glory and thanks, the word of the living God. The Apostle Matthew writes, when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Whom do man, who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said in reply, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him in answer, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And I say to you, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Sheol shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no man that he was the Messiah. This is the truth, peace be with you. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Expectations 
things that we desire, things that we try to foresee. This is really the life of Saints Peter and Paul. Or should we say, this is the life of Shimon and Shaul, their original names of Simon and Saul, who are born in Jewish communities, of course, but Jewish communities which are a minority and surrounded by pagans. Expectations, well, because it's just human nature. We like to have things in hand. That's why in the human psychology, from the town of creation, we all love conspiracy theories because it gives an answer for things that somehow they escape our total comprehension. And so when we can find kind of a nutshell answer, we like that. And we do this all the time in expectations, expectations, things that we desire. Our disappointment with the way things turn out, again, because of expectations. The number of people who will be lamenting their hot dogs and their hamburgers because it's raining. But of course, someone with wisdom says, we have needed this rain for months, and so this is actually a blessing. But it's not about my expectations of my hot dogs and my hamburgers. And that really what it comes down to is about me. And that's always the thing that makes us trip up in the spiritual life. Me, my expectations. This whole chapter of 16 of the Gospel of St. Matthew is fascinating on this point. Because it begins with the Pharisees demanding a sign from heaven in order to believe our Lord. That kind of very adolescent prayer, prove yourself to me that you exist, why I should be going to Mass. Very, very adolescent. And our Lord simply rebukes them and says, you are perverse and an adulterous generation. And they'll be given no sign, and he leaves them. And these expectations then, you have our Lord talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes, beware of it. And the apostles are wringing their hands in the boat at this point in Galilee because they haven't forgotten to bring the picnic. There's no bread. They haven't bring the food. And so when our Lord says, beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees, again, their expectation is, oh, he noticed we didn't bring bread. So he's upset. Expectations. And our Lord is saying, how long, why is it that you don't understand even after all of this time that I have been with you? Don't you remember, we fed 4,000 people with nothing, a couple loaves of bread. And remember all the baskets, the enormous baskets of bread that was left over, far beyond anything we began with after having fed thousands. Or in the other episode of the 5,000 that were fed, twice now, the multiplication, and all of the hampers that were picked up with all of that bread. No, I am not speaking to you about bread. Beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. Again, expectations. And they begin to really understand at that point, oh, our Lord says this is their teachings, their doctrine. It poisons. Leaven is very small, but it, it raises the whole batter, the whole dough. You don't need much. Again, expectations. And then they're way in the north in this part of the gospel that we have today. Who do men say that I am? Expectations. They're in Caesarea Philippi, which means they're in the area known as Banan uh, Panias. It's, one, it's the source of the Jordan. So they're up north. They're, they're quite amongst the midst of pagans at this point. But it's a huge cliff face upon which is the city, the brand new city of Caesarea Philippi. Philippi. So Caesarea of Philip. This brand new city has just been built in the last decades. It's glorious, it's new, it's fantastic. And it's built on top of this massive rock fixture from which you have the currents and the streams that come down that begin what becomes the Jordan all the way down to the Dead Sea. That's why St. Matthew points out where they're at. It's important to understand they are standing in front of an enormous rock cliff face. And the meaning of Shimon's name 
Kefa, rock. All of this has great importance. And the brand new city that has been built upon this massive cliff face. All of this matters in detail. Again, then our Lord asks the questions of expectations. Who do men say that I am? And they come up with all of these answers. They think you're one of the dead prophets. They think you've come back. And then our Lord stops him and he says, but who do you say that I am? You're not like other men. You have been taught with a good leaven. And that's the magnificent answer of Peter saying, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And this is an act of faith. This is not son of God in the sense of being a prophet or someone who is close to God, because son of God can also mean that in the Old Testament. This is an act of faith, which is why our Lord, of our, his faith in his divinity, of truly being God, which is why he says, Simon, Shimon, Bahriona, Simon, son of Jonah, you are truly been blessed because you don't know this by just watching me. This has not been revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. That is the grace of faith. And that's why this is a stupendous moment for the apostles, him speaking forth, certainly in the name of them, but this is Simon's profession of the faith that this rabbi standing in front of us, who we don't usually understand because of our expectations, is truly the Son of God, divine. And then, of course, the magnificent response when he says, but I have given you the name, Kepha. I have called you rock. I have given you this unknown and to people's ears, stupid name. No one's called rock. Who baptizes their daughter Boulder? Nobody. This is the same, we're so used to the name Peter now, we forget about the fact that this was like, I don't know, you know, this is like calling someone pixie. It's like, well, all right, what is it supposed to mean? And now you're just going to be called rock, standing in front of this magnificent brand new city that is planted very much on top of this huge cliff face. And he says, I have called you rock and I will build my assembly. I will build my church, my body upon this rock. So we see the connection that takes place. But again, expectations. Because after this, you notice at the end of the gospel, our Lord says to the disciples, tell no one that I am the Christ. Now you would expect that he would want them to tell everyone that the Messiah has arrived. Again, expectations. But then it gets even better in this chapter. Because our Lord, we're told, from that point on, begins to tell them, we're going to go to Jerusalem, and I am going to be betrayed, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be abused and spit upon and scourged, and they will put me to death. And on the third day, I will rise from the dead. They don't hear the last part of the phrase. On the third day, I will rise from the dead. They only hear everything else because again, expectations. So much of what are happens in our lives is because we already have these prejudged conditions that they're supposed to be in. And that's why at this point, Simon is quite, well, let's say he's quite pleased with himself, like we often do. Our spiritual lives go well, we seem to get what we want from our novenas, and we're pretty chuffed. We're pretty content. And of course, we attribute it to our prayers and my novenas. And this is Peter. Expectations. So what he does in this sense is he looks at our Lord and he says, oh, no, 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 no. This will never happen to you. You're the Messiah. And our Lord turns on him and tells him to get behind me, Satan. You are a scandal to me. 
You're trying to trip me up because you savor the things of man and not the things of God. You do not appreciate the things of God. I have just told you exactly what is going to happen. And remember this name now that Kepha is called is Satan. Shaitan is an adversary, someone who stands in opposition to me. That's a brutal rebuke given by providence, especially after having said, I'm going to give you control over the whole kingdom of heaven. Whatever you wind up judging and doing will have an effect upon heaven that you take place on earth will have an effect. Binding and loosening, this is the sovereign power. And in this aspect then, expectations. Peter and Paul have to learn, and that we have to imitate, all of us. And that we also have to, and otherwise God will do it for us, shatter our expectations. We live our lives in a way in which we like to follow the gospel when the gospel corresponds to what we like, expectations. Now when you think about Simon and you think about Paul, our Lord immediately after this section in this chapter 16 says anyone who wishes to follow after me, to come after me, must carry his cross and follow me. So after this severe rebuke to Peter, he tells everyone exactly what you have to do. You want to learn from me? You have to carry this instrument of death every day and walk behind me. This is brutal. This is not something we will normally want to hear. And this is why our Lord is correcting them and letting them know you do not tell this to anyone but I'm the Messiah. And why? Because you don't even understand what that means yourself. If you want to follow and learn from me, you must carry this cross every day. And that's when you have the famous quotation, for the one who will save his life will lose it. And the one who loses his life for my sake, our Lord says, will find it. This chapter is the entire crux of the entire gospel, this chapter 16. And I highly encourage you to read the whole chapter. Because what Simon, what Shimaun and Shaul have, remember that Simon is, he's a fisherman. He lives in the Sea of Galilee. He lives, he lives a straightforward, simple life. He would have the education that he have. He's living like everyone else. He has his expectations. He lives his Jewish life. He's obviously faithful and they're surrounded by pagans. In fact, the only apostle who we have a likelihood of considering comes from outside of Galilee is Judah. Judas, the one who betrayed our Lord, very likely came from Judea, which was primarily Jewish. But Saul, Saul is born in Cilicia, this now southern part of Turkey, where the, where the eastern Mediterranean bends and comes down. That little niche by Cyprus and that whole area, that is Cilicia, that is where St. Paul is born. Of course he's surrounded completely with pagans. But he is given of not only a good Jewish education, he has a zealous Jewish education. As he says, Pharisee among the Pharisees, he is given a fine education. We don't know what his parents did, but we know they had enough money to send their boy away to go to do his schooling in Jerusalem. And he studied with the best of the rabbis in Jerusalem. And these two men, when you read the Gospel and the Acts of the Apostles, it is beautiful because you see what God does. Their lives are not easy. When we think about the saints, we think about pictures and statues, as if these people came out of their mother's womb with a halo on. 
and we forget what it cost to arrive at holiness. Saul and Simon, well, you see already part of the being kind of backhanded and slapped around by our Lord in this chapter already because of Simon's misapprehensions and his false expectations. Saul's is even more profound. Remember that when the way, which is what Christianity was called in the beginning, the way, this is the path of the Messiah. That when this first takes place, Saul is, will have none of this. Saul is probably about 26, 27 years old. And who has not been puffed up in their own estimation at 26 and 27? And Saul, of course, has reason also to think about himself and his judgments because of the fact that he was taught by the best rabbis in Jerusalem. I am respected by the temple authorities. I know what's going on. I know what the path of God is. This is Saul's attitude. We are told very clearly Saul is standing there when they stone St. Stephen to death. He is there. He is the one who eggs the rest of them on, if you like, because this is just. He's a young rabbi. He has all the credentials. And he is the one who is behind the beginning of the entire persecutions that break out in Jerusalem that start with Stephen. Stephen's just the first one to die. And that is in a large part due to Saul, this young rabbi at the age of 26 to 27. And not only is he so well respected, he is given letters from the temple of authority, warrants, to arrest every man and every woman he finds in synagogues who are following this heretical way. Because this is an offense to the religion of God. It's important to keep in mind who these people truly were and what God did to them to make them better. And that is the disposition of Saul when he's going to Damascus. Saul is not in the middle of saying a novena. Saul is on his way to arrest the men and women in Damascus and to drag them back to Jerusalem in chains when God smashes him off of his horse. Remember, we used to, when our world was a little more Christian, we used to have phrases like that, being knocked off your high horse. That's totally Christian, totally from the Acts of the Apostles, completely St. Paul, and completely unexpected. And he is left blind, not eating for days or drinking for days after this. This young rabbi, humiliated outside of Damascus, driven into the dirt, falling off of his horse, and the men who are with him, they have no idea what's going on. They hear a voice, they hear something, and they see a light. And this man, who is so sure of himself, has to be led by the hand into Damascus. We think our lives are hard. We should be praying for these types of blessings. Show me who I truly am. Let me see what I am in your sight. Let me see myself as you see me, Lord. That was not the prayer of the rabbi Saul. And they have to be broken out of a vision because, of course, the only thing that they see is that God's religion is only about Israel. And Simon, even after Pentecost himself, has this expectation. Both of them have dramatic ways in which they are transformed. Peter was much more gentle at this point. Our Lord had already smacked him off of his horse earlier in chapter 16 of Matthew. But for Peter, it has to be, he is given a vision that is replicated three times, and then he is sent to receive into the church the very first pagans to be baptized, Cornelius and his family, the Romans. Their whole lives are dumped on their head. 
But not only are they dumped on their head, they are universalized and made larger. Now, this sermon is long today and I'm sorry. But it is connected also with what I have written in the bulletin today. God is always asking us to take the next step in the path of the gospel. We always have to go outside of our expectations. If it were easy, I would tell you it were so. But being a priest who has worked on numerous continents and traveled around the world with different people who have different expectations and different countries, I can tell you that none of it is easy. But it does help shatter our expectations, which in the end are the things that cripple us the most. What was holding back the rabbi Saul was his expectation of this is the way God works. And God has to smash apart all of that prejudgment, all of that prejudice in order that he see larger. And he becomes the great apostle of the nations, bringing in all of these non-Jews into the church. And Simon, after Pentecost, he at one point will stop eating with those non-Jewish converts because of course under the Judaic law, that's polluting. You can't dine with non-Jews, it contaminates you. Simon who had baptized the first Romans into the body of Christ still because of the nee, 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 of the other members of the church, we're told in the Acts of the Apostles, stopped eating with those non-Jewish members of the church. And St. Paul talks about this in the letter to the Galatians because he confronted Simon about this. What you do is wrong and it is scandalous. We are all brothers. And so it shatters and breaks open and makes a much more universal vision to what the gospel is and to how the path that we follow on, it is better for us to understand that we are most secure when we walk purely by faith with our eyes closed in the darkness of God. And when that happens, then we know our path is most secure. That's why the rabbi Saul was blinded. And so in these expectations on this day, we honor Saints Peter and Paul, these men who finished their lives by being murdered because they gave testimony to the truth. None of us should expect anything less. That aspect of what God had done to both Shimaun and Shaul enlarged their heart and mind, inflamed them with zeal, and allowed them to the strength to give testimony even to death. And that is something that we must desire as Catholics. It's hard. Forget about hot dogs and hamburgers. That's an expectation which is like piddly. What we have is a desire to bring this gospel of truth to every man, to every woman. And we have to pray for the ability to be able to communicate it to others. Both of these men were made universal. Both of these men were made in a real true sense being dramatic. They had tremendous things to accomplish. You heard the listing. Shipwrecks, being stoned, being beaten, being betrayed by my neighbors, being betrayed by foreigners. That's dramatic. But they were made because of this shattering of expectations. They were made exceedingly apostolic. And in that apostolicity, in the end, they died. And that's what the commemorations of St. Peter and Paul is, because the tradition in Rome is that they died on June 29th. We're just solemnizing it today, in the year 67, perhaps 69. So let us ask for the intercession of Saints Peter and Paul today, that they give us the courage to enter into our prayers, to ask the Lord God to shatter our categories, to shatter our expectations, and to allow in that shattering that the light of God truly infuse our minds, our hearts, 
so that we can see with the eyes of God in wisdom and be able to be led by that gift of wisdom of the Holy Spirit so that we ourselves may replicate in some little tiny way in our own little corner that universal vision of that apostolic desire and that charitable zeal. And may their prayers be a rampart to us always. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
to you, Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we, remember, as we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God and from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, our Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saints Mary and Saint Jude. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the repose of Gibran Carter. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. sincere kiss in the spirit of your unending love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith which is pleasing to God. blessings and assistance, for we are weak, and you are the support and refuge of all. We raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your only Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, may the light of your face shine upon us. 
Deliver us from every evil and blot out all our transgressions, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It's right and just. Truly it is right and just to glorify and exalt you, O maker of all creation. With the angels we glorify you, and with voices of praise we cry out and we proclaim. He then commanded and instructed them, saying, Each time you celebrate these holy mysteries, you remember my death and resurrection until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O Lord, we remember your coming that saved us. And as we await your second coming, we offer you praise and ask you. On the day when you will judge the righteous and sinners, do not condemn us because of our sins, but have compassion and mercy upon us. Turn your holy face away from our sins and assist us. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. As we 
your sinful children receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you when we ask you. Have compassion on our soul, have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O oh my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Panin Mario, Manin Mario, Anin Mario, Nite Mordo Hayo Parisho, Wanachen Alain Uar Corbo no Bono. May those who share in these holy mysteries be cleansed body and soul from every sin and receive eternal life. Amen. O Lord, accept our intercessions and our prayers and grant security to your people and peace to your flock. Protect our shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, and Gregory John, our Bishop. Assist the priests, the deacons, and all those who serve your Holy Church so that they may intercede and pray to you on our behalf. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, those who have asked us to pray for them, those who were desired but were unable to make an offering, and those who assist your holy church. Be a shelter and a refuge for them, for you are the savior of all. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the civil leaders in our country and throughout the world. Enlighten their consciences to bring security and peace to your people. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, Saint Joseph, Saint Jude, Saint Marin, Saint Paul, and Saint Peter, and all the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy of their reward. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the righteous fathers and teachers who have gone to their rest among the saints. Remember those who diligently carried your gospel throughout the whole world and confirmed your holy church in the true faith. Assist us through their prayers and strengthen us in your love. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Favor, remember, O Lord, our parents, brothers and sisters, teachers, and all the faithful departed here and everywhere who have gone to their rest. Forgive us and forgive them of all sins and offenses. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever.
Lord, and you are the pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your, your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you, to you be glory forever. O God the Father, you strengthen and you encourage us, for we are weak. We implore you to purify us of every sin and to accept our offerings so that in one spirit we may call upon you praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. O Lord, lead us not into the trials of temptation that we do not have the strength to overcome, but deliver us from every evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, bless your worshipers who bow before you and implore you. Make them worthy of your mercy and forgive all their sins, for you are almighty and rich in compassion. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory.
again and again we thank you, O Lord. We raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. A lover of all people, have mercy on us. Thank you, O oh Father, for this gift that you have given us, though we are unworthy. Do not shame us because of our sins, but help and save us, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. Lord Jesus, stretch forth your right hand and bless your people. Protect them by your cross and be their shelter and refuge, and perfect them with your abundant blessings, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your blessed Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So, because today has been a washout, it's just a reminder that the parish barbecue will be on Friday, which will hopefully have less of a chance of rain. And so, of course, to remind you, on July 9th, this coming Friday, grab one of the flyers. You'll have the phone numbers to call ahead, so we have an idea of numbers. And we will be as delighted to see you this time around after the exuberant and beautiful time we had in June. And so, please come one and all, and I wish you well on this Independence Day. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, 
the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.